In the early 2000s, a new wave of American horror directors emerged whose gruesome, gory films harked back to the grindhouse cinema of the 70s and 80s, which these filmmakers all grew up watching. Film critic Alan Jones coined the name of this group as The Splat Pack. The Splat Pack consisted of Rob Zombie, Neil Marshall, James Wan, Greg McLean, Lee Wanell, and perhaps the most synonymous figure with this label, Eli Roth. Eli Roth was a 31-year-old enthusiastic movie nerd fresh out of film school when he made his debut feature, a body horror that worked as a throwback to 70s exploitation cinema called Cabin Fever. Pancakes! Pancakes! No pancakes. Pancakes! No pancakes! <laughs> Cabin Fever was a huge hit and was referred to by Quentin Tarantino as the best new American film. What do you want me to do, man? What? But it was a couple of years later in 2005 that Eli Roth really made his mark on the evolution of the horror genre. He made a film about a bunch of American bros traveling to Eastern Europe who were kidnapped and taken to a Slovakian torture dungeon. This movie opened at number one in the box office and became the biggest grossing horror of 2005. Not only that, it launched its own entire little subgenre of horror known as torture porn. Join me as we continue our journey through the mind and body as we discuss the first two movies of Eli Roth, Cabin Fever and Hostel. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in our sixth season, which we are calling The Mind and Body, and this is part 25. Uh, this episode is sponsored by $20 patron Frank, and uh, this episode, as the intro, suggested is going to be covering two Eli Roth movies in spoilerific detail, Cabin Fever from 2002 and Hostel from 2005. Of course, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the kind of extreme cinema from this era in other countries, Japan, South Korea, and of course, France. So now it's time to take a little look at the torture porn movement going on in America during this decade. Joining me to discuss all things Eli Roth and torture porn is a very good longtime friend of the pod. He is an actor, director, writer. He performs live ghost stories with his theatre company, Book of Darkness and Light. He is also the host of the Ghost Stories Book Club podcast and a very good friend of mine. Welcome back to the podcast, Adam Robinson. Hello. Hello, Mike. Thanks for having me back. Oh, no worries. Thank you for being here. Uh, we've had quite a few chats on Patreon over the last few months, but I think this is the first time you've been back on the main podcast, maybe since Night of the Demon. So it's been a while. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Has um, it really been that long? Yeah, has, of course. It, it would have been. Yeah, it's yeah. been quite... I mean, so for people out there listening who, who, you know, who aren't subscribed to Patreon, let me just start off by asking you... How has how how has this last crazy year been for you? <laughs> the, the 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 tone of your voice uh, is 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 great there. Um, I'm all right, you know. I have to, I I can't really grumble. It's been it's been challenging, hasn't it, for everybody? I think. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, uh, I've managed to keep working. Um, uh, I've managed to keep you know creating uh, stuff and and putting it out there and and kind of finding an audience online. Um, yeah. and actually I've ended up doing some really interesting projects that have, you know, that I wouldn't have done in any other circumstances. Obviously, you know, all of my touring has been, uh, canceled or, 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 you know, put back at least till next year, which is really devastating. And, and, and this time of year, 
Uh, I'd be at my most busy. I'd be out, you know, touring a, a, a ghost story show uh, with my my pals um, mm-hmm. uh, in the company, and obviously that's not going to happen this year. Um, and that it is sad, you know, it really is sad. And actually, I keep seeing posts. You know, Facebook likes to remind you what you were doing five minutes ago, doesn't oh, it? Oh God, I know. And um, it keeps telling me about what I was doing this time last year, the year before, and it's all uh, about touring and, and being on on the road with, um, of course, with yeah. you know people I do the shows with. And that's kind of sad, but you know, I I have to keep going back to this this thought that in the scheme of things, I, I'm all right, you know, and and I've been really fortunate um, in lots mm. of ways, and so I'm just kind of holding on to that positivity uh, where I can, really, you know. Yeah, I mean, I've loved um, sort of watching and following all the stuff that you've been doing this year. Like, uh, I came, I did one of your work writing workshops, which was yeah. so much fun. You did an amazing Thanks. live show on Halloween. Like, you've been nailing it in terms of kind of making all your stuff virtual, which is, I mean, thank God, a eh, for like technology and everything right now. You I know, know. And, I, and again, this is what I mean. I, you know, I'm really interested in the ways we can we can put our stuff out there. I'm really interested in um, audio. Uh, as as a as a medium and, and and the way to tell stories and create theatre, I guess is is my main job. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I just the, the honest truth of it is, I I I really need to be busy. I need to be busy. Yeah, if I'm not yeah. busy, that's when I start to lose my mind completely. And um, I just don't <laughs> I don't deal very well um, when I'm not busy. When I haven't got something to do, and, yeah, and that same. worried me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you know talking to the business man in the world here aren't I so. <laughs> but again out of, out of choice I mean right, I think right. we're, we're very similar in that respect yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah, yeah but you know it's it, and I'm so grateful you know there's I've, I've talked to you about it on the Patreon a couple of times there's this group on Facebook um, that's like an offshoot of my uh, Book of Darkness and Light Facebook page who came together really soon uh, after lockdown when I started doing these writing workshops and they're just incredible. They're, they're such nice people. Um, a lot of them are uh, Evolution of Horror listeners. Hey. Um, a lot of them I've converted into Evolution of Horror listeners. I love it. <laughs> um, but they're just dead nice and it's a really supportive um, community. And, and I don't think I, I've gone a, a day really without checking in on that group and even just to see what they're posting. So I think, you know, in that regard, the way people have pulled together has, has, has been amazing as well. And I'm yeah, I'm just grateful for it. Yeah, that's awesome. So, um, what I, I mean, it's been really interesting because we, you're, you're Mr. Ghost Story Man, right? I mean, we've <laughs> talked so many times about Mr. James. We've just recently on Patreon talked about Lake Mungo. It's all been yeah. like subtle, character-based, interesting, <laughs> low-key suspense stuff. You know, ghost stories, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, with, 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 you know, we're coming at a slightly different area of the horror genre together this week, which we I'm quite bit. excited uh, to talk about with you. Um, so let me ask you, first of all, you know, gore movies, you know, splatter movies, torture movies, whatever you want to call them. I mean, have you got a good stomach for this? Are you a fan of kind of the, the more extreme end of the horror genre spectrum? I don't gravitate towards them, in all honesty. <laughs> like that, they're not as, as you just said. I do love a ghost story. I mean, I I love I love horror. I, I the the whole spectrum. I'm really into it. And and one of the things I love about going to Fright Fest um, and kind of attending the digital version this year is you don't know what you're going to get. It's a real mm-hmm. smorgasbord, and um, and 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 that's the fun of it. I don't, it, you know, if I found out there was there was a an ultra gory body horror movie coming out in the cinema next week. I I wouldn't charge towards it. I wouldn't yeah. put it at the top of my list. I'm all. I really like atmosphere. I really like story. So if a horror movie's got a great story, it's compelling, and there's a ton of gore in it as well. I'm all over it. That's yeah. that's fine by me. I really am. Um, it's when the gore is there, kind of in place of story, that that I'm I turn against it really. Yes. Um. Because I think, you know, good horror is often about something that we're not seeing on the screen, right? It's often about something else. It's often as much about the subtext as, as anything else. Yeah. And um, and that's what I th- I find lacking in in some uh, movies that are, that are just, you know, f- put the gore, you know, front and centre. Yes, absolutely. But this is what I love because I was kind of shocked to discover that you, Adam, you wrote a dissertation on torture porn, right? Is that right? 
I did. And I'll tell you something. I was thinking about this this week. So it's my anniversary with my, uh, with my partner this week. Yeah. Um, 13 years together. Thank you very much. I, congratulations. And, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. And we, uh, the first time I met her um, parents was at her MA graduation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, polite chit chat ensued and we were nattering away. And um, I think it was her mum said to me, Oh, and you're doing a dissertation, aren't you? What's your dissertation on? <laughs> and Anna just turned to me and she was like, yeah, what is your dissertation? Do you wanna, why don't you tell my parents what your dissertation is on? <laughs> because in the title, um, as you say, it was uh, torture porn was featured in the title. <laughs> um, but it's not an, a, an advocation even of my taste at uni. I wasn't into these movies particularly like for fun uh, as such. I'd been to see them. I was, you know, I was, I'd, I'd been to see them at the cinema because they had, the, well, at, at the time, I don't remember there being a great deal of, of horror choice actually no, in, in, no. the, there, in the there, there was There was a point when this was all of the stuff that you could go watch in mainstream horror at the cinema, right? Which is what yeah. we'll get to. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I just, I became very interested in, um, I did, I, I was writing a lot uh, in my uh, master's, which was on uh, American literature and culture. Mm. I was writing a lot about um, uh, 9-11 and, and, you know, the, the things that had happened after that and the, the, um, the societal reaction and the, and the, how it was still affecting things, even in obviously 2006, which, which is when I was doing my uh, master's. Yes. And, um, I I was just, I think, I mean, I don't know how I came to, to do the, this particular topic, but I, I became aware that it didn't seem at that moment that a lot was written or at least published on the connection between torch upon movies and, um, you know, post 9-11 yeah. uh, concerns, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, so, that's yeah. very, I'm, I mean, and this is what I'm quite excited to discuss with you because I think there is a lot there. I think there is... Yeah. Particularly that when we when we get to Hostel, I think that there's pretty definitively uh, that's a story that is trying to say something. Uh, how successfully we'll get into that, but I think yeah, it is yeah. trying to say something about America in 2006, mm. right? I think. Mm. Um, and and there was, yeah. I mean, at the time even, and, and particularly since that, there is there is now loads written on this topic. Yes. You know, I, I must say, I, <laughs> isn't, I'm not the only person who wrote on it. Loads and loads of people did, but at the time that I I started writing, I don't remember feeling that there was a lot published um that was on on this particular topic but yeah i mean it's it's really i think that is interesting how well um these films engage with the material or whether they are symptomatic in and of themselves is this reflective of taste yeah yeah rather than these are films about a particular topic you yeah. know cuz i my my guess is that at any one time there's a ton of stuff on tables of producers all over the place. Yeah. And trends, I guess, must emerge from producers looking at what's doing well. Yeah. You know? Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, I, th- I think there's, I think it's interesting. And there's always that argument, I think, with everything. Um, and, and you know, I think that when you look at horror, I mean, we've spoken about this so often on this podcast, it, it, it of course, goes in waves and cycles. And, you f- and it's mm. kind of like you get a glut of the sort of nasty or horrible stuff. And then you suddenly get a glut of kind of the low-key ghost story stuff. And it goes back and yeah. the pendulum kind of swings back and forth. And, you know, horror cinema in America at the time, in a me- mainstream American cinema, was a little bit weak i think in some yeah. ways i mean we'd had that sort of that wave of 90s teen slashes which are so much fun but i think a lot of people were quite upset that they'd really taken the edge off the horror genre right and uh yeah apart from the blair witch which was kind of an anomaly again didn't really have any violence or gore in it the no. the rest of american horror at the turn of the millennium wasn't great and i think people were getting kind of the more interesting mainstream horror from outside of the US right and I think so I think you know just as much as it might be political and social I think also it does come down to film trends and waves and everything else right yeah, I think it's yeah. a bit of everything I think considering it all together it's a really interesting uh, phenomenon actually yeah I mean it must have been really interesting looking at it that at that point because I think I, th- I, I that must be really difficult because I find that sometimes it's only it's only it's only easy to get a gauge of kind of an era of horror when you've kind of, Mm. you've gone past it, I suppose. Like I'm already thinking now, what are we going to look at as this last four years of sort of Trump era horror as well, you know? And, 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 but it must've been quite, again, amazing that you, you were probably one of the very first people to, to, to really acknowledge this and write about it academically because 2006, that was kind of right in the midst of it, if not sort of 
early on in that movement, right? Yeah, I mean, my dissertation and um, my dissertation sort of really got going. I think towards well, in two thousand and seven, actually, because I did a two years MA. So I guess I mean. I, like I say, I, I remember not being able to get hold of very much specifically on the topic of horror uh, and the way it was dealing with torture around this time. That's not to say it wasn't out there, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah it, it did feel it did feel um, uh, it did feel like I was doing something. Uh, I don't say cutting edge, but but relevant and 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 interesting because it was about now. It was yeah. about something that was happening now. I read my dissertation um, again in preparation for. Oh, I haven't did touched you? It. Yeah, it, it, I haven't touched it since I submitted it. I don't think. Um, and it's interesting actually going back to something that I wrote. Um, what was it? You know, thirteen years ago, and realizing how much my uh, perspectives have changed, and how different I think I would have made that mm. that piece of work in some ways. Um, and yeah, it's it, it was quite interesting revisiting it. Um, mm-hmm. But I remember being, I remember immersing myself in all this stuff, and uh, and reading everything I possibly could on the idea of 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 torture and 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 cinema and the discussion around uh torture that was happening at that time uh, yeah. was really fascinating yeah yeah absolutely let me ask you then before we get back to america uh, and these films specifically you know the last couple mm. of weeks on this podcast we've been kind of going outside of the u.s at this kind of wave of again quite extreme films from different countries specifically around the world me and tim coleman looked at old boy and uh an audition from japan and korea mm. and then this last couple of weeks particularly we've been looking at french the new french extremity um mm. with you know alex west and people like that talking about of course movies like martyrs inside trouble every day irreversible all of those uh, do you think there's a difference like do, do, how what are your thoughts and how familiar are you with those sort of french movies for example that came i guess sort of slightly before the boom of american torture uh, films uh, maybe Maybe tonally they are quite different. Maybe certainly with Martyrs, I was thinking about it today. Um, there's there's a philosophical level to that film, right? Yeah. There's a there's a even perhaps even theological, um, yeah. almost certainly theological uh, question kind of floating around in in the background of that movie, and it kind of feels like again, as I said earlier, that the the subtext is really important, and and you. You're invited to to um, you're invited to interrogate that subtext. You're invited to think about why we're being shown this stuff, you know. Yes. Um, and it takes it I deadly th- seriously. I think it takes it well. re- exactly. Yeah, it, there are the no tone. there are no laughs to be had in no, martyrs, no. right? Whereas I feel like, in, again, in these films we're about to talk about, I think there is a deliberate yeah. attempt to make these films kind of quote unquote fun as well yeah. as nasty, right? And there's slightly there's 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 a layering of of uh, of humor and of artifice in in some of these uh, Hollywood torch porn movies that I never I don't know I'm never convinced by it actually I'm certainly not convinced by it, by it in the in the films we're going to talk about today um, but do you remember there's a movie called Captivity do you remember that film Yeah I've not seen it but I remember mm. the I remember of it Yeah. And that kind of—I mean, it's another—you know—it's another one in that in that genre. But it, it it did seem to play around with this idea of artifice about what was real, about um, you know, f- even things like fake injuries and 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 things like that. And mm. and uh, 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 trying to think of the word, um, prosthetic injuries. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But it, it, like you know, plastic injuries. That yeah, the, yeah, yeah. That the tormentor had sort of put on. Um, I'm I'm going to be careful with with spoilers here, but yeah, look, looking at fake injuries, and I think that that even in even as as a thing in itself is really interesting. That it's it's not <laughs> it's not always taking this idea very very seriously, but at the same time, the anxieties at the heart of it seem to be very real. It seems to be responding to a very real anxiety. But you, but you can tell the difference, can't you? I mean, when you're watching, as you say, something like Martyrs. Um, versus something like uh, Cabin Fever. This is a completely different ball game. There is. It's, I find it fascinating, actually, the difference, because I think it's easy to potentially lump all of them in the same category. That thing, you yeah. know, Audition, Martyrs, Hostel, they're all part of the mm. same thing, but they're actually so different, all of them, in how they tackle these sorts of subjects and, and the idea of torture as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And let's, let's just... Pre- I mean, we've, we, you, you kind of touched upon this already, but, you know... 
let me ask you the america at this time it was like a bit of a there were, it was a bit of a kind of simmering boiling pot of things going on right i mean mm-hmm. um you i'm sure you know all of this a lot better than me but obviously we had 911 a few years earlier there was a war in iraq right and also there was this kind of there was a, it, what f- appears to me like a growing fear of people and outsiders right in inside america and i think maybe outside in the rest of the world a growing fear of Amer- like of america themselves as well this mm. kind of like hostility both ways i think between america and other cultures and other nations and then those nations towards america too and uh and and also the emergence of things like youtube and the internet mm. that meant that there were kind of again going back to this idea of torture and 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 footage of the war and stuff that was suddenly kind of popping up on people's computer screens right as well that was kind of very easily accessible and again kind of all of this stuff all kind of happening Mm. at the same time in this era kind of like a yeah like a perfect storm it certainly did feel like that didn't it It did feel like suddenly you you know i i'm i'm not american um myself so i can't i can't speak with experience of that but it it it, it it was something that I considered in in the in the dissertation was this idea that um suddenly uh those very very um public attacks those very very enormous um attacks on September the 11th um did change something change the way people looked at everything really yeah. um and you know in 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 the essay I sort of talked about how there was a sense of now America feeling uh, vulnerable and and no longer impenetrable mm-hmm. or invincible even and how actually through as you say the um the the so-called war on terror and 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 everything that that led on from that suddenly the vulnerability um of the body and and specifically I I considered in in my essay the the american body um uh-huh. uh, became really pertinent and certainly seemed to be what some of these filmmakers were 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 trying to uh tease out trying to trying to discuss mm. but it's interesting you mentioned things like youtube because actually um another part of my dissertation was about um uh scopophilia which is this kind of uh joy of looking or a sort of perversion of the joy of looking and watching yeah. and actually a lot of these films are bound up with not just the idea of torture but the idea of watching torture the idea of um the layers at which we feel safe watching these things mm-hmm. um and again there's another one called vacancy um and there's a really interesting scene in that movie i know we're not talking about that but it's it's a bunch of guys watching a room uh, watching monitors in which they can see a room where two people are watching a sort of uh, torture-based snuff film or something right. like that. So it's that layering, it's that safety. And where, of course, behind that camera, mm-hmm. you know, where one one uh, one jump behind that. So it's really interesting this idea of, of 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 how we consume torture, how we how close can we get um, uh, at this time? This seemed to be a, a consideration. How close can we get before we're an active part of it? Before it feels like we ought to, con- you know, condemn what we're doing? Before we feel complicit? Um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's a fascinating uh, fascinating topic. So torture porn itself. Then um, let me ask you first of all: Would you? Would you? I mean, do you think torture porn is a kind of pejorative term? I mean, do you think that? I, I feel like there's still a slight reaction, maybe to people that like these films, that they don't really like the term torture porn. Should we even mm. be using the term torture porn? It's well, you know, it's it's kind of neat, isn't it? Yeah, it's a neat. It's a, it, you <laughs> it's, know, it's, it's a shortcut, isn't it? It's it a shorthand. Is. Yeah, I always think this about you know. I remember your discussion. Um, uh, as part of a panel at the BFI uh, last year, I think it was, where you talked about this idea of elevated horror. Yes, another phrase and that I, some people hate in the horror community. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, if it's used dismissively, I'm not into it. Like, yeah. I, I th- if it's used snobbishly, I'm not into it. At the same time, we we know what we mean. Exactly. If that if that phrase is, is used, we sort of know what we mean. So sometimes it's quite useful. So I I I'm, I don't take it against it particularly. Um, it comes as far as I know though from a, a, an article by David Edelstein. That's my understanding that he that he coined uh, that phrase, and that is a re- you can still find that um, 
uh, that article online. It's called Now Playing at Your Local Multiplex Torture Porn. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you just do a quick Google, and it, it's actually a really, really interesting uh, article where he talks about, uh, you know, entitlement and uh, and innocence in, 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 in this case in particular, uh, American males abroad. And, he, he, you know, he starts to discuss films that, broadly could be considered in this canon like The Devil's Rejects, Saw, Wolf Creek, but also things like The Passion of the Christ, which I think is a really interesting inclusion. Yes, that's a great... Um, that's a, I mean, a very important film in this time, right? Huge yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. I walked out of that film, actually. I couldn't, <laughs> I could, that was, I couldn't stomach it. I couldn't stomach oh, it. Oh, God, was, it was horrendous. I went to see, yeah, I went to see it. And the bit where... Um, He's being uh, tortured, uh, uh, like the first scene of torture. I just, I was like, I, do you know what? I don't know why I'm here, and, <laughs> and I just, and I just left. I um, but yeah, but but in in that uh, that essay, that uh, article, should I say, by David Edelstein, he does ask this question: um, Why America seems so nuts about? Uh, sorry, why America seems so nuts these days about torture? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's interesting that you know, as I say, that's 14 years ago. Um, that, that that article was written and he's asking a you know a kind of interesting question which in terms of looking back for historical context um could could be yeah it could be quite useful for the for the cinematic historian <laughs> well let me tell you when i tried googling and take this as a warning to everyone out there because um the first time i tried just googling the phrase torture porn when researching for this it just came up with loads of loads of porn hub uh results <laughs> and it's the sorts of porn hub results i didn't really want to actually see or delve into i was like oh yeah. god no i need to be i clearly need to be more specific with my search terms here and this uh... is me at university though mike can you imagine that <laughs> in the library Hiding your screen as people walk past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, it's, it's for research. <laughs> I remember actually, I did my. Um, I, oh, I don't. I don't go. Th- I don't do things lightly. I did my undergrad dissertation on um, uh, Sallow. Oh my god! <laughs> I know. I know. And uh, I remember going to get. Um, the uh, Marco de Sade text uh, at Borders when it was still open. I remember taking it to the the counter and saying to the guy, hey, "I'm doing a I'm doing an essay on this," and he went, "Yeah, of course you are." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did you just briefly? What do you think of the film Salo? Because I watched that uh, this year. Actually, we covered it on Patreon. Oh, I've I think I've. I must have watched it ten times when I when I did when I did yeah because I just because I was the the tutor that I was working with he was he was brilliant um, and kind of introduced me to the film believe it or not and it, it, but he was really brilliant he was such a great tutor um, he was all about detail he was all about the forensic and um, and so yeah I, I you know I just watched it so many times oh I mean God. I think I, I think in 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 loads of ways it's a really fascinating. Um, part of Pasolini's uh, filmography mm, you know if you mm-hmm. compare it to lots of the other stuff that he did um, it's a very very interesting film it's not an enjoyable film by any means no. um, and I, I, I and therefore I don't know why I would ever recommend it to anyone in all honesty um, but from an academic point of view <laughs> and from a point from the point of view of, of being interested in I guess that idea of Sadian philosophy um, of this idea of you know the rehearsal of execution yes. the, and my my uh, essay was on the anticipation of cruelty um <laughs> my god i love this the dark recesses of adam yeah. robinson's mind this is oh, he's the spooky ghost guy <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly yeah. what the hell i love it i love it um so yeah i mean it's interesting i mean you mentioned you know uh movies like uh, devil's rejects i mean there yeah. was a there was a group of directors that emerged all around this time Rob Zombie was one of them, but of course, Alex Arja, James Wan, Lee Whannell, and perhaps most importantly, Eli Roth, right? Mm. Um, And I think what's really interesting about these directors is they're all of a similar generation. I think all of them grew up on sort of splattery, gory movies from the 70s and early Mm. 80s. And you can tell that is what has, what is the biggest influence on them, right? All of them feel like they are channeling these kind of exploitation movies of the 70s and 80s that we hadn't seen in mainstream horror for a while, Mm. particularly Eli Roth. I really got fascinated by special effects makeup. You know, I started reading Fangoria magazine and reading books by Tom Savini and Dick Smith and reading about how they did the makeup in The Exorcist and The Godfather and The Incredible Melting Man, reading about Rick Baker and all these people, you know, these that are my heroes who I've been, you know, very fortunate to meet a lot of these guys. have been really, really nice and cool and enthusiastic and supportive. 
Um, but you know, I, I always looked at horror movies like an art form. And my mother's a painter. And you know, we'd, I'd look at paintings of Goya or Bosch, and I never saw violence in a painting. I always saw it as a representation of violence, just as when you read a Cormac McCarthy novel, there's, not, there's violence in the books, but you're just reading a violent story. Somehow with movies, people think it's real. And if you've truly done your job as a director making a horror film, people are so disturbed that they think you actually killed those people. And you can have the actors next to you, you can have them on the audio commentary talking about it, you can show the behind the scenes, but people still, there's something that just gets them in this visceral, guttural place of, well, you still did that to someone. And it's like, no, they're acting, they did a really good job. But, the, you know, and what's great is that with the best, the beauty of horror movies is that, um, you know, one of the wonderful things about horror movies, you know, one of the wonderful ironies about horror movies is that you spend all this time with the lighting and the photography and the casting and the costume and the sound and the scare and the script and everything. And if you get it all right, nobody's watching. Everybody's watching it like this. Like, literally the highest compliment you can get with a scary movie is when people say, I didn't see it. So let's start talking about Eli Roth himself then. Uh, Adam... First of all, just, I mean, if there's anyone listening who doesn't know who he is, who's Eli Roth? Who's Eli Roth? Eli Roth is <laughs> is a director, a film director, who, um, who whose career began, as far as I can tell, properly with, with Cabin Fever, which is what we're going to talk about. Um, I think before that, he worked on various different productions, didn't he, in, in various different capacities, so far as I understand. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not an Eli Roth biographer, I must say. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on it, any of this stuff. Um, but then, as, as I understand it, Cabin Fever brought him to the attention of Qu uh, Quentin Tarantino, who, yes. who was a big fan of that film. And even, I, I uh, heard the other day, put, Eli, put a thank you to Eli Roth in one of the Kill Bill movies he's in yeah. the credits kind of thanking him um and then and i then of I, course and then of course eli roth popped up in uh i think death proof which was tarantino's horror movie that was made around that time eli roth was also in inglorious bastards so was, they, they yeah they developed quite a friendship clearly at this and, time and i read somewhere and again please uh, this is what i read and, and i'm happy to be corrected if this isn't right but I, as i understand it he got the idea for hostel while swimming in quentin tarantino's pool <laughs> um, might, might be apocryphal. It might be <laughs> nonsense. Or do you mean like metaphorically? He was swimming in Tarantino's pool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think literally. I think. I, I, I'm sure I read that. Was it a dream? Might, no. Might, uh, to be honest, it sounds very much correct. Run that by the lawyers, <laughs> Mike. But I think I'm sure I read that somewhere. Um, and then kind of they discussed it, the two of them, and 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 he. Eli Roth kind of went away and wrote a first draft like really quickly after that uh, uh, after that exchange, um, and then in all honesty, my relationship with Eli Roth disappears really after after Hostel. I I watched the um, what's the one with Keanu Reeves? Um, oh, knock, 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 knock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched that out of morbid curiosity and actually to see, in all honesty, to see whether it was. So I watched the trailer and I thought well, this is this is kind of feels like a very Eli Roth movie but how am I going to watch it and and he's changed his uh, perspectives on things is it going to be less as I see it gratuitous um but I didn't enjoy it <laughs> but yeah say yeah I mean either let me ask you that leads me nicely to this next question then I mean you said mm. you, you you saw the trailer for not knock and thought is this the typical Eli Roth thing what yeah. do you mean by that what is a typical Eli Roth movie in your opinion well he's there's tons of gore. Yeah. Um, there seems to be, it, and I, I'm again. I want to stress. I'm talking about Cabin Fever and Hostel. Yeah. Primarily, the films that I, made him a name, really. You yeah. Know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I don't. My, as I say, my my watching of his films kind of stops at those those two. Um, but the you know there's a preoccupation with the body, both kind of inside of the body and outside of the body. Mm -hmm. There's a very Old fashioned. I'm trying to be really polite here. Old fashioned uh, use of nudity, which feels to me really feels jarring and and out of place. Even you know uh, in Cabin Fever, which is almost almost 20 years old, isn't it? It's coming up on 20 it is. years. It is. Um, but it's still even at the time. Um, I was certainly looking at other films in uh, at that at that time. It feels kind of like something you'd see in a 70s movie and not in uh you know a 2003 movie Absolutely. or 2002 um and yeah that that's that's kind of it. it it's 
torture is a big deal uh, in it. Ickiness, um, blood, gore, over-the-top special effects in terms of the gore seem to be a big part of it. Um, it's interesting that in that essay, uh, that article, sorry, by David Edelstein, where he talks about uh, torture porn, and he makes this point that um, that in these new movies, in this new um, uh, genre, uh, subgenre, these people, these victims, are no longer interchangeable nor expendable. Is the, is the is what he uses? But actually, in in these two movies in particular, I think they are. Oh, I think completely. Yeah. I, I, Cabin Fever, for example. I know we're going to get into it, but I I I couldn't tell you a name of a character in no, that. No. I really couldn't. No. Um, and I think that's. I think, but I think that's kind of interesting. I think. I think the expendability of his characters. Um, whilst not something that kind of you know gets gets me going or, or is something that interests me in terms of horror cinema, is an interesting thing to observe. Yeah, I agree, and I think there is. This is where it comes into a kind of, you know, do these films share more in common with the sort of torture f- films from internationally around the world at this time, mm. or actually do they share more with slasher movies? I think essentially, and we talked about this a little bit in our slasher series, that these kind of films are really what slasher films got replaced with in the sort yeah. of turn of the new millennium that idea of disposable teens just being offed one by one right i mean really yeah. and it feels tonally like they're a bit more on the the slasher end of the spectrum like they're just kind of like fun broy kids being fun like just you know it like yeah. you say beer tits and blood basically yeah, it's like yeah, to put yeah. it really crassly like exactly. that is that is yeah. it isn't it um yeah yeah uh, that's what i should have said when you asked me <laughs> with that question beer tits and blood yeah. Yeah. yeah next question yeah next question <laughs> yeah exactly um what's interesting that i was thinking about watching the uh, watching them this time is that the one difference between his films and your typical slasher films even those mm. kind of horrible grindhousey ones of the 70s was so much about a kind of final girl right there were always, yeah. always a female as that like sort of last surviving character his films yeah. have final boys i guess um they do they, they I mean- are centered on the kind of the, 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 they are purely about male characters, to be honest, aren't they? I mean, the mm. female characters have even less to do than they do in slasher films. Absolutely. I mean, when you get into Hostel Two, that does change a bit. And mm. again, that was I did, I did. I've not seen Hostel Two. Mm. You know what? I, I I did look at it as a sort of secondary text for for this dissertation. So again, it's a film that I watched a few times, and I own it. You know, I got it. Um, and so I and I was I, I was thinking to myself, I think it is a more interesting film. And then I watched it, and it, it kind of, in some ways it suffers from the things that I've I would criticise in terms of Hostel, which is it it just goes on a long time before anything really happens. There's definitely more story in there, so it it, it you should have a look at it. I reckon mm. have a look at it. Um, oh, you're gonna kill me when you <laughs> you're gonna watch it and <laughs> yeah. be like, oh, he told me to look at this. I know, no. To be honest, I've I've just had this conversation on social media with Jamie Graham as well because yeah. I was kind of vocally not being very nice about Eli Roth, and, and Jamie yeah. Graham was like, well, what about Hostel Two? Haven't you seen Hostel mm. Two? I said, no, I I didn't bother with it. I never bothered with it, and he keep he kept saying, give that a chance. That's the <sighs> that's the good Hostel film. Um, it, I mean, that's that. But you know, is that not damning with faint <laughs> praise? I don't know, but it is. That's the good. Um, it's. I would say it's better. It's got. It's got interesting. It's got more interesting female characters in it, mm-hmm. which you know, these these two films don't. And it does have. It does try to do something, I guess, a bit more interesting with the status of victim, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, as I say, I re- I, had, I really looked at it when we were going, knowing we were going to be chatting, and um, I I don't know. Have a look at it, Mike. See what you think. Mm, yeah, <laughs> we'll no, do, we'll I do will. another one. And- <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. We'll come back to Hostel Two at some, <laughs> at some point. Uh, so let's begin. Let's start talking about the film then that really kind of launched Eli Roth's career, and we'll get into a few more of these topics as we go through this film, perhaps. Uh, so let's begin by talking about Cabin Fever from two thousand and two. Can you help me? No, 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 no. She's not coming near me. What's your your problem? Oh. You guys gonna kill each other now? You don't look so hot. Help me. I need, need a doctor. I don't want to get sick. I don't want any of us getting sick. We just don't want to get it. I see where you're at here right now. He's coming towards us. All right, back off. Oh. He looked like he was skinned alive. The party man. Is it safe? Don't worry, I'm healthy. Leave us alone! 
Somebody help! I'm burning! A group of friends rent a cabin in the woods during spring break. Stopping off at a local store, they encounter some of the eccentric locals before heading to their holiday home. After killing an evidently sick man, the group, one by one, fall prey to a flesh-eating disease. Unable to trust anyone, they begin to take drastic decisions and desperate measures in order to survive. Lovely. Very nicely put. Uh, So, (laughs) let me start off by asking you, I mean, I feel like we've talked around this, and it's probably pretty obvious maybe how we feel about Eli Roth and his films, but let me Mm. start off by asking you, Adam, what do you think of Cabin Fever? I'm not into it. I'm, uh, (laughs) like... I I watched it when it came like soon after it came out I watched it I remember watching it on DVD good old DVDs I got mm. do you know what just a little tangent I got there used to be a DVD vending machine <gasps> at no our way. university yeah and it was it was you rented DVDs from this machine oh, it was amazing did they ever honestly. get stuck because that would be really annoying oh loads of times yeah. yeah and you yeah. rang the number and nobody ever picked up <laughs> anyway yeah it, but I remember I, I I think I got it from that and I watched it with um an ex-girlfriend and uh, I, I re- the only scene I remember from that first watch is the uh, the scene in the bathroom which we'll, we'll get to um, and re-watching it I thought well I wonder sometimes you go back to these films uh, don't you as a, as a more mature person and you think well actually there is there is a bit more in this than, than I thought there was oh, unfortunately kind of the opposite happened and I, I just I didn't I didn't enjoy it I felt it was a real mess yeah um, and and it the thing is it's it's his first film it's his first feature film yep um so i think that's worth you know uh, putting into uh, the mix in terms of uh, consideration um i always i really don't like criticizing anything that's art, artistic um if i can help it because it's hard doing this stuff's really hard yeah um and anyone making a film is impressive it's yeah. always impressive of course it absolutely is. yeah but my you know my experience of watching it as a as a consumer of horror was no i didn't really get it it was all over the place it felt to me um and it was trying i read a bbc um article that said something like it was the director's too clever for his own good and kind of jumps between genres and 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 things and and the tone of it is all over the place and i think that is possibly the biggest problem with it um i you know i also think that i just it really feels like a 70s movie when 10 minutes in i don't know anything about the characters but the you know the one of the women is topless and they're yeah. having sex. Like I I don't know anything about these people and and this is what's happening and that sort of the way that that was you know would have been presented in a in a seventies film. It, I don't know. Not that not that that makes it okay because it was in the seventies. It doesn't. It's still it's still a problem. But seeing it in a film from the noughties is really quite. I don't know. It's I, jarring, I isn't very, it? Yeah, it really jars. And I felt surprised and a little bit disappointed about it, really. Yeah. I think it felt needless. It's it's amazing how much horror has changed even in the last 20 years, actually, because mm. I think now we expect so much more. I don't. We just don't expect to see this in a particular... I mean, you might see no. a film like this in a, a, a lineup of 60 films at Fright Fest. You're always going to get yeah, a film yeah. a bit like this, right? But in these kind of like mainstream big cinema release horror films, which this was... Yeah. You, we are now watching movies by people like Jordan Peele and Rose Glass and yeah. and Ari Aster, and it, mm. I think it. I, I, I'm so pleased that we've come so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, totally. compared to the stuff that we were getting 20 years ago. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think cool. it's important to like n- nudity is not the issue, really. No, it's the, not at it's all. the lens, it's the way, it's the gaze, isn't it? It's the way. Uh, it, it's presented. There's not, you know, we're not saying there should never be any nudity in any films ever. That's not it. But there's something very leery about both of these films that really feels upsetting and it feels um, it feels objectifying primarily. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's yeah. just a bit uncomfortable to watch. It's, um, it's, I know. And I think, again, this comes back to this idea that this is a filmmaker and I, I, I'm sure Quentin Tarantino is responsible for this. Um, he's, yeah. He was this... Famously, of course, he was this filmmaker who was this huge film nerd. He was this film geek mm. who worked in a video store and then wrote his first screenplay. And he's every single film he's ever done has been in some way an homage to a film he grew up loving, you know, from the 70s yeah. or whatever. Eli Roth is is, is that exact mold, ex- 
except Eli Roth also isn't as good a filmmaker as Tarantino. Mm. That's the yeah, difference. Yeah, it's an interesting point. But he's point. kind of doing the same thing, isn't he? And I get it. And we all get it as horror fans. It's like, yeah, yeah clearly from watching Cabin Fever, you love The Evil Dead. You love Texas mm. Chainsaw. You love, you know, Cannibal Holocaust. You love mm. uh, all of these films, you know, Deliverance, all these films that he's referencing. Yeah. And it's like this... this this teenage boy film nerd is let loose and in charge of a Mm. film set that's kind of Mm. what it feels like watching cabin fever and you're right tonally it's all over the place it's like they throw in loads of random jokes and then they throw in some tits and then they throw in some blood and none of it and i I think this improves a bit with hostile to be honest but i think in cabin fever in particular none of that really hangs together does it no it doesn't and there's a there's an interesting um well, there's a, there's an interview with with Eli Roth on on the on the uh, the DVD as a DVD extra, yes. uh, on on the edition that I've got, where he talks about you know he really likes these early '80s sex comedies, uh, and he cites um, the Last American Virgin, Porky's, and Bachelor Party. Right. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, and yeah, and he says I want I want to I wanted to make a movie that felt like a '70s and '80s horror movie. So it's interesting that kind of in the same almost in the same breath, he's talking about. You know these these seventies uh, sex comedies. These sorry, these eighties sex comedies, and then talking about the sort of horror movie he wants to make. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's particularly successful um, in in blending those two things. And in fact, my memory of Cabin Fever the fir- from the first time I watched it was that there wasn't any comedy in it. I don't, what I'm saying is I don't remember mm. there being any comedy in it. So it was kind of a surprise to see attempts at it um, this time around. And I just don't, I, for me, it just doesn't blend together uh, very well. And actually the character that uh, Eli Roth plays himself, I think I wrote in my notes, um, is the least funny character in, yes. <laughs> in horror cinema. It's very, very weird. And I think, yeah. you know, I mean, we've we've both actually in the last few months, because you, correct me if I'm wrong, you have recently rewatched a load of the Friday the 13th movies, right? I did. I rewatched them all. <laughs> so, I don't know why. I love it. I love it. Why not? In lockdown. And the thing is, <laughs> yeah. I, I've rewatched the load recently as well. And I was thinking, even, this is really saying something, even Friday mm. the 13th, the kids, of course, it's that same kind of thing. They all turn up at the lake. They all kind of get naked and jump in the lake and skinny dip together. And there is that element. Yeah. But even that, those films are somehow less leery and hate- yeah. and hateful. I don't know, like yeah. even the, the, the kids, as as kind of archetypal as they are, they're sort of more wholesome and 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 kind. Yeah, than, than, I don't like than, than the ones in these films. You know, I don't like any of these characters in Cabin no, Fever, and no. it's 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 really strange. Um, and I, I wrote down again in my notes, why are they hanging out together? They don't. None <laughs> of them seem friends? to like each other. Yeah, they don't seem to like each other. There's that guy, that kind of archetypal jock guy, who's just awful. And you quoted, yeah. you know, a bit of the dialogue on on Twitter. I think I saw it, and it's yeah. uh, and it's just. Uh, horrendous and I wonder if like there's so there's a lot of slurs you know homophobic slurs and yeah uh, early doors there's, there's you know a horrible um uh, racial slur and um I, and it I don't know it almost feels like he was trying to emulate like an adult version of the wit of someone like Joss Whedon Yes. You know, that sort of back and forth that's really funny, really well observed, um, witty, kind of yeah. uh, a little bit a little bit weird. And I it, and when I was watching this, it's like it, there's an attempt here to to create comedy dialogue, but it's just falling flat and, oh. and I was astonished actually at some of the <laughs> at some of the uses of uh of language in this film. it's 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 another thing that's just really dated it and actually you can't mm. believe that i mean surely this was really dated even in 2002 but the the racial yeah. slurs and the homophobic slurs there's something about it you know again because you know it's made by this like straight white dude yeah makes it because there's nothing there it's not saying anything is it it's no, not no. saying anything about racism or homophobia that no i mean it's really overtly homophobic that there is that is. that you know and that carries through to pretty much all of his films that that, yeah. that crops up in everything and, it does and a kind of i don't know i don't think eli roth likes women very much either to be honest you know they're it, all very expendable aren't they and and don't you know and and kind of no consideration to me from my observations of these films is put into their development or 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 even their motives and actually 
I'll come back to that point in a minute, but more broadly, um, I, di I did not know 10 minutes into this film what anybody was doing, what anybody wanted, what their agenda was, what was at stake for them. And that's really, to me, is is fundamental in, in any movie. I want to know what's at stake yeah. you know, up front. I want to yeah. know what what's on the line for these characters. I want to know where they're going, what you know, what what their agenda is, so that so that I can see what these obstacles are to stop them getting the things that they want. It feels yeah. like relatively straightforward um character development and storytelling. But so Karen, who is the um the person who contracts the virus first, right? Yes. Who gets this illness first, um suddenly changes personality or just keeps changing personality it seems with there's no consistency and it's not for any reason and there's a scene soon after she sort of contracted the the illness where she's sort of smoking and she's kind of cool yeah, you know yeah, like yeah, she's yeah, suddenly yeah. like this badass like the the um the disease has has turned her into this kind of like mean girl yeah um and the other thing is obviously when um uh what is it marcy is that the other the other character marcy, yes the other female character yeah uh, um uh decides to, in the thick of this um, horrible situation to shave her legs. Shave her legs. Yeah, she has to have sex and then shave her legs, right? Yeah. It's yeah. it's it's really, really bizarre. And and the I'm not I'm really not trying to find reasons why this why this might have been put in there because I just think it's laziness and, and not very good writing. Mm, um mm -hmm. But the only thing I, th I could think of was routine. But then I thought no it's I think what's happened is he wanted that scene with the with the sh with the razor of course and, and, he the did. and the flesh coming off, and of then course. you need a reason to do that. But I don't know. I just think that if I think that if that had come way earlier in the film, at a point where we didn't know what this crisis was, you you'd have been like, you wouldn't have thought twice about it. But it's just totally. that this was a character's really. This was the character's decision and their motive. It it, it doesn't feel like like good writing to me. No, and and the thing that I wrestle with with these films. You know, I don't always have to have a film where I like the characters in order to be engaged. You know, it's not, no. you don't always have to have likable characters. I think it does help with horror, but because you want to empathize. But, but the thing I don't quite know is does Eli Roth like these characters? Is he, yeah. is he making a comment about obnoxious American teens and how awful they are? There's not a lot of evidence that it's disciplined enough to be making any kind of comment. If yes. that makes sense. Yes. If the film was a really disciplined film, but it was nasty and horrible, yeah. I would almost be more inclined to like it, be, or, or to you know to find something um, particularly positive to say, because the discipline would suggest that the that the director had a, a clear agenda. Yes. and to me, it, it's just all over the place, and I never really know who's. Yeah, if I if I close my eyes, or, or if if you read the script to me and I have my eyes closed, I wouldn't necessarily know who was saying what. No, a lot totally. of the lines could be you could jumble up those lines and they could be attributed to to more or less anyone. Yes, um, in that group of friends, and I think that's a problem as well. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean it, and and you know, was it? I think it was George Romero talked about um, touch upon films being light on metaphor. I think was how he put it. I think. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that is kind of what we're seeing here it, it's it's not really about very much except what we're seeing yeah um and that's you know if that's your thing in horror if you're into that absolutely you know there's there's room for all tastes i i reckon um and if your thing is just to watch you know um movies where, that are really really about the the body and the and the sort of the uh disassembling of the body if you like yeah um then, then cool. But that, that for me, that's not what I'm after really in in a good horror film. So, yeah, I find it quite tr tricky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, agreed. And I think you, I think that's true because, like, the, I guess you know, let's talk about the actual horror itself. Then the the yeah. the the body horror, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. I mean, you know, mm. continuing on the, the the stuff that we've been talking about this whole series is that there is a certain element of Cronenbergian body horror, I suppose, yeah. to this, right? Um. How do you think that's handled? You know, the 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 sores, the skin coming off, that whole kind of the way that this infection manifests. Um, again, do you think there's anything more to it than what it is? I mean, again, Cronenberg was so famous for kind of telling stories about more than just, you know, the flight isn't just about a man turning into a fly and et cetera, no. et cetera, you know? Um, 
how do you, you know how successful do you find the the body horror elements in this film some of it's pretty grim and and and, and actually in a <sighs> In a different film, I think I'd enjoy it more because yeah. actually some of it's quite effective. Actually, that scene where where you get the razor, um, you know, context aside, is actually really horrible. And oh, it, and it's do, grim. Yeah, it's properly grim. And and um, and the dog, you know, the dead dog at the beginning uh, is is just so over the top in terms of its presentation. And again, I wonder if I wonder if the film if there's a version of this film that's played more straight and played more um, without the laughs, the attempts at laughs, which would actually be more enjoyable and more funny. Yes. Because I think if you're really po-faced with these, with these things, that to me is way more enjoyable and way more funny. Um, I think it's, I think that I have to say, I think the effects in this one, and we'll come on to Hostel in a bit, in this one, I think the effects have kind of aged quite badly, really. Mm, um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, there's a, a few moments where I'm just like, oh, that is horrible. I think the most effective moment of what I would still consider to be body horror is where um, uh, uh, Ryder Strong from Boy Meets World, who's the main <laughs> yeah. character, by the way, yes. um, uh, <laughs> when he falls into the reservoir onto the corpse. Yeah. That, I think, is really good, actually. I think it's a really horrible um, moment where you just go oh no yeah. and you can imagine it you can imagine trying to get away from it in that situation where you know when you're in the water and, and there's like a you know, if you're in an outdoor pool and there's like a leaf or something worse <laughs> floating towards you like a spider or something yeah. um, and you can never get away from it and it kind of feels really nightmarish so I think in that regard that's 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 pretty good yeah um, um, apart from that you know it, it, it yeah <laughs> I think um, I think the idea of the body horror work still i think i think this is the mm. one thing that that is successful in this film and i think that the, uh, this is the this is the film really i mean i think like you mentioned it feels like eli roth has kind of manufactured a story in order to get these set pieces in that he had thought of so yeah. a woman shaving her legs in the bath and literally shaving the skin off yeah, is something yeah. that he had to reverse engineer to make happen in mm. this story clearly yeah, right? yeah. Um, but it works I mean I think you're right I think maybe the effects now have age and it is a cheap film it was a first film but I oh, think yeah. it still kind of made me wince I've got to say in its favour that that scene with her shaving her legs still mm. made me go because I'm quite squeamish about that kind of stuff yeah. and yeah. um <laughs> And it is, it's really grim, isn't it? Because I think we all have, we've all shaved with a razor and I think we can all kind of, (laughs) kind of relate to what that would feel like and how awful that would be, you know? Um, She keeps going though. This is the, this is the thing I forgot. Yeah, why does she not notice? She she keeps going for ages (laughs) and it's like, no. And actually, again, I wonder whether there's something about discipline there of the director, but um, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's another, it's another you know, just a reason where plot takes a back seat to, no, let's just yeah. keep going with the gore. Let's just keep giving the audience this gross, yeah. gnarly set piece, you know? I would be like, in a genuinely non-confrontational way, I would genuinely be interested to hear what, you know, if people like this film, if people are really into it, what 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 is it? What is it about it that they like? I'm just, I, I'm quite interested in, 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 I don't think I'll agree, well, but I'm interested in that. I'm going to out somebody, a uh, friend of the pod and f- good friend of you and me, Rob Watts. Uh, <sighs> sorry, Rob, because he's Easy. the only, because I posted about watching Cabin Fever and literally everyone on my timelines were, were going, ugh, hate that film. And Rob Watts was like, I can't believe you don't like Cabin It's so much fun. <sighs> so there you go. Rob, so we'll, 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 right. we're in a WhatsApp group with Rob, with uh, Rob, so we'll uh, yeah. we'll ask him. Sorry, <laughs> Rob, to out you as a cabin yeah. fever fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to give you know people a hard time. I'll give Rob a hard time. I don't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. We can challenge Rob. That's fine. Um, yeah, but you know, I. <sighs> I do understand. Like, I remember I saw this at the cinema and I mm. saw oh, did this. Um, I'm going to kind of, you know, point out our slight age gap here because mm. I remember I was 14 and it was a 15. And it was, wow. I think, the first film that I got into pretending <gasps> to be 15. So I was very yeah. excited about it. And the mm. whole scene, I think I was with my, maybe my girlfriend at the time or friends or something. It was like a group of us young people. And, uh, and the whole cinema was filled by people that were about 15, which I'm sure, let's be yeah. honest, is the target age group, right? Yeah. And yeah. even then, I didn't actually like it very much. But no. I remember there was lots of laughter and people, mm. gr- you know, really kind of um, audibly being grossed out by those mm. moments. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's what it is, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's a, it's a Friday night in the cinema for teenage kids to kind of yeah. gasp and laugh and be grossed out. And we're just... We're just bitter old men now, Adam. I think that's the problem, you know. <laughs> well, um, yeah, maybe, maybe so. I mean, I, I think, I think oh, this is what I think about the next film that we're going to talk about as well. I think there is a version of this film, yes, that 
cuts out the homophobic language, cuts out, you know... Oh, yeah. um, it's the, the broiness of... that I can't bear. Yeah, yeah. If, it feels like we're kind of watching something that's, that's hot on the heels of American Pie, but I don't know. And like, I don't, I don't want to... I'm really happy to condemn it for those reasons is what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Anything that, inc- that includes um, homophobia and, and um, misogyny as I see it, you know, and, and, and kind of that, that, that part where they use the N-word at the start. And, what and the it, hell is that? And it, that it's that's bizarre. a set up to a punchline at it's the end a, of the film. Exactly. And again, the worst punchline I've ever seen. I mean, let's just briefly talk about the ending because I do not yeah. understand, Adam, what the fuck no. is going on with the end of no. this film. Why Why does the kid shout pancakes and do like karate moves? Um, why do <laughs> the the shop o- the racist shop owners uh, have a gun for? you know black people mm, why mm. then is there that random joke at the end where the black people turn up and they all yeah. play music together like I, what again is it's like bizarre. is there a reason for any of that has that got anything to do with this story you know it's just it doesn't feel like it does no and it feels completely out of place and i think that it's it's it seems to be an attempt at a joke of course you know that's 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 it, you know it's as you say it sets up a joke mm. but it's so clumsy and so unfunny and needless use of that word and i just think for that reason alone it, it really needs to be condemned like yeah, that that it it's utterly utterly needless and i think it's used again as well i think i think that word is used a couple of times in in the space of a few minutes in that opening scene in those opening scenes i think yeah yeah and it, as you say it comes to the end and and it, and it and it turns out that it's like a punchline for a, a joke in inverted commas but the thing is even when i rewatched it the other day when i got to that end scene i had forgotten the specifics of that early scene i knew that they'd use uh, that that you, that word had been used but i'd forgotten um uh the 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 full context of it so that when it comes to again in inverted commas delivering on that joke mm. it, I'd forgotten so it does it didn't work and it just felt bizarre and i yeah i just found it Oof, no, I didn't like that at all. It was it, it's it horrible. felt horrible. It's yeah, horrible. Really horrible. There, and there's something. It's not commenting on anything. It's not just Doesn't an seem awkward. To be, no. It's not. Yeah, there's something. Again, I I can't help but think there is something quite hateful about yeah. these films at their core. It seems it seems kind of casual as well. Like I I, yes, I want to that's I what it talk, is. It's casual. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just kind of thrown out there as if oh, you know, this is this is just what everyone says and everyone thinks. Yeah. Th- that seems to be the the position. It's so casually used. Um, I I want to talk a little bit about uh, about that in uh, in the next film as well. But um, yeah, the, there's the scene in this that really I'd forgotten about again, and 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 looking at it uh, again really troubled me. Was the bit where um. Ryder Strong's character, uh, Paul. It's Paul, isn't it? Yeah. When uh, Karen is asleep next to him, mm, mm-hmm. and he basically goes to sexually assault her. Right. I mean, he puts his hand down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And 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 again, I don't know. Like, what? I think when I watched it the first, maybe when I watched it the first time, perhaps I wasn't paying that much attention. But that. That is essentially what's happening, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't, yeah. I haven't misunderstood yeah. that. Yeah, and it, again, it's just to kind of get that sort of gross payoff. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. It's yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Which in itself feels very misogynistic, actually, even in that. Oh, super. The, like, I, I, you know, again, who knows? Maybe we're thinking too much into this, but it did actually feel like that was a scene about a, a boy being freaked out by a girl's period, basically. That's exactly what, what that what felt like, let's be honest. Yeah, and that's and the I way thought. in which all of the guys particularly go, ah, and scream and shout and kind of recoil at that moment. Yeah. The guy characters yeah. in that scene, I mean. Um, yeah, it's... It's a, th- there's so much of that throughout mm. these films, like you said, mm. that is casually thrown in that makes yeah. this such a kind of heinous watch you know Um, and that's the thing it doesn't because i don't think that was shot as a film Uh, sorry i don't think that was shot as a scene about um a sexual assault i don't think that was shot like that no but she's asleep and 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 therefore obviously can't give consent Mm. um so far as we can see in in you know uh in in that scene that does not happen and it i don't know it just it feels yeah 
yeah, I did. I felt very uncomfortable. I kind of feel uncomfortable talking about it. Actually, yeah, it is. So, it is a little it's bit so unpleasant. It is unpleasant. And again, it's just you know all of this. And we're not. I, I don't. You know, I don't think that either of us are are, are, are you know prudes about this kind of thing because I think no. you know you can have all of these things we've talked about in a film if you're mm. handling it, if you're making a point about it, right? If you're making a film about homophobia, if you're making a yes. film about misogyny, if you're making yeah. a film about racism, uh, yes. if you're making a film about awful teen American culture, whatever it might be. Mm. But this film isn't doing any of those things, is it? It's just no. kind of like bathing in it and using it for yeah. laughs, really. Yeah, 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 um, absolutely. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, maybe we should wrap up. <laughs> maybe we should wrap up on cabin fever. Um, you know, I tried to. Be, I, I the one positive thing I can say is that I think the body horror still works quite well. You know, there, there yeah, you go. and there you, go. you know, again, I I'd written a couple of bits down that I that I thought were, you know, being really really fair to it were vaguely. Uh, positive. I, I, the re- the reservoir rev- revelation. Ooh, that's yep. quite hard to say. <laughs> reservoir <laughs> revelation. Yeah. And again, I, I, the, the one thing I was gonna, I, I forgot to ask you was, you know, watching this in the context of now we're in a global pandemic. I yeah. Mean, does that add anything to you? Does that change how you view these sorts of films? Are you particularly kind of sensitive to these kind of infection movies right now? Do you think? I I, I hoped it would 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 be interesting in that regard. But yeah. actually, I did. Uh, the the thing that I did find interesting was the paranoia. The idea of of being paranoid, I thought was was kind of interesting and and dealt with in in a pretty interesting way. And in their behaviours and the things that they did and the fact that they couldn't trust them anyone but i just felt i think i'd rather be watching the thing the thing deals you know, with that perfect that's all you know? i thought as well that that moment when they or even the evil dead you know when they shove yeah they shove their friend in the in the cellar and lock her under mm. the trap door or when in the thing when they shove the, the first guy in the in the outhouse because you're right you yeah. know that paranoia that you know, that fear of infection and mm. I know Eli Roth knows all this. This is the guy, as you know, just as an aside, by the way, I get an email almost on a weekly basis um, from various people going, hi, Eli Roth, I love your <laughs> podcast. It's like, no, no, <laughs> Eli Roth does the history of horror. This is the evolution of horror. Oh, but I know no. that Eli Roth is a huge fan. He loves this stuff. He loves the genre. He knows. Of course. He's the ultimate film. He knows all this stuff inside out. Mm. Um, that's why it's even more disappointing in a way. Mm. But maybe this is why, you know, us film fans, we can be fans. It doesn't make us filmmakers, does it? <laughs> yeah, that's the exactly. Thing. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Mike here, just interrupting this week's episode momentarily to spend a minute to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 patron Frank. Uh, Frank is a long term listener and supporter of this podcast. And Frank, I am hugely grateful to you. He didn't have anything to plug this week, but he did send me a really nice message which I thought might be nice to read out on the podcast. Frank says, Dear Mike, I'm a huge fan of the podcast. I can't remember exactly when I started listening to it, maybe halfway through the Ghost series, but I was immediately hooked. The reason I subscribed at a $20 level is because I feel I owe you a lot for one thing in particular. It's been a crazy year for everyone, and I've been lucky that I haven't been sick or haven't lost anyone close to me, but I did move away to another country for a new job at the start of March. I live by myself, and I didn't know anyone there. The first few months of proper lockdown were strange and isolating. At this point where I was, only supermarkets were open, and we had very restricted hours on when we could go out. But I will never forget the first online quiz you organised. Even though it's just a picture on a screen with you and everyone else there, it made me feel for the first time in months that I was actually around others, which genuinely picked me up. I've joined in all the other quizzes since, but that first one has a very special place for me. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, Frank, for that lovely message. Um, it sounds like you've had a tough year. Like, I mean, of course, everyone's had a tough year in some way or another, but I think, you know, what you went through there, moving to a, another country, living by yourself, starting a new job, not knowing anyone, and then ending up in that scenario where you're stuck self-isolating in quarantine um, must have been incredibly hard. So I'm glad that I was able to help in any small way I could. And don't forget, Frank, that there is an incredible community of listeners here uh, for this podcast. And so, and this goes to anyone out there right now who is feeling particularly isolated uh, or alone or just, you know, feels like they just want to escape horrible real world stuff right now and chat about silly stuff like horror films with fellow horror fans. 
come to the discussion group. That's on Facebook, the Evolution of Horror discussion group. There's also a message board on Patreon, uh, on our Patreon page. You know, let's all keep in touch with each other. Let's all be there for each other. That's what communities like this can do. So thank you again, Frank, this week's $20 donor and official Evolution of Horror sponsor. Good evening. And thank you for allowing me to come into your living rooms. Are you crazy? I hope so. With all my heart, I hope I'm crazy. We all go a little mad sometimes. Two fellows meet accidentally, like you and me. No connection between them at all. Never saw each other before. Each one has somebody that he'd like to get rid of. A man is assaulting a woman at 125 West 9th Street, second floor, at the rear. Make it fast. They're coming. They're coming. This week was part one of our new exclusive Hitchcock mini season, available only for ten and twenty dollar patrons. That's right, across this Hitchcock mini-season, we are going to be discussing all of his major classic films in chronological order. This week was part one, and me and Rihanna discussed two of his early British classics, The 39 Steps from 1935 and The Lady Vanishes from 1938. These two films were so much fun and they were so much fun to discuss. I absolutely loved it. And if you subscribe to Patreon at a $10 level, you will get access to those two full in-depth discussions right now. Not only that, over the next few weeks, we're also going to be launching more mini seasons for $10 patrons, including our Saw retrospective in which we cover every single movie in the Saw franchise and our Hellraiser retrospective in which we cover every single movie in the Hellraiser franchise. Oh lord. Uh, so if you want to sign up to that and a whole lot more, you can. Head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. You can sign up at either a $3, $5, $10 or $20 tier and get different benefits accordingly. $5 will get you access to regular bonus episodes every single month. $10 will get you access to those aforementioned exclusive mini seasons. And $20 will make you an official evolution of horror sponsor. And I will also send you a personal personalized video message as a thank you. So head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Everybody who signs up from the UK will be sent an evolution of horror sticker and everybody, no matter where they are and how much they donate, will get a little mention on the podcast as a thank you. Speaking of, I'm going to give everybody who signed up in the last couple of weeks a very special thanks. So a big thank you to Gracie Dr. Pinky, uh, Graham Scaberas, Nicole Hamilton, Elise Schmidt, Ali Ellison, uh, Chaz Mullins, Carl, Katura Lambert, Frank Showalter, Dana Abney, Kevin Lyons, hey Kev, Ashley Sheldon, uh, Sean Sloan Dennison, Jamie, Dan Berry, Martin Webster, Adam, Flunky Footle, Amber Ross, Katie Dunn and Adam Greaves and the rest of his British Embassy Moscow Film Club, Will, David and Duncan. A huge thank you to all of those people for donating their hard-earned cash to support the evolution of horror. And one more time, if you want to join them, if you want to be treated to regular bonus content and get access to our exclusive new mini-seasons, then sign up now. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Okay then, let's return to the rest of our Eli Roth discussion as Adam and I discuss 2005's Hostel. Hostel. American tourists Josh and Paxton are backpacking through Europe, along with their newly acquired friend, Oli. After being locked out of their accommodation, they meet another traveller, Alex, who tells them about a Slovakian hostel where the boys will be able to hook up with any woman they choose on the strength of their American accent alone. Travelling to the hostel, the boys find themselves caught in a sinister world where tourists are perched by wealthy men for the sole purpose of torturing and murdering them. 
So, <laughs> without 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 wanting to have the, all the same conversations again, let me first <laughs> start by asking you, what do you? I mean, you must have seen this film a lot, right? Because was this this must have featured pretty heavily in your dissertation? Yeah, I, I watched it a lot. Um, what do you think? I, I mean, again, it, it it's definitely. I think it's a better film in some ways than than Cabin Fever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it does repeat a lot of the mistakes, I must say, um, mm-hmm. of Cabin Cabin Fever. Um, I think you've still got that. Um, there's still quite a lot of kind of homophobic language in there. You've still got a lot of um, misogynistic language in there as well. Mm. Um, Trying to put all of that aside, I think it, it it works better. The script is way more disciplined. The story, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a story that, that at least is told in a relatively linear fashion, and, and there's not too much crowding in there. Um, I you know I don't particularly like it. I didn't particularly like it even when I was was studying it. Um, mm. I remember so, I saw it at the uh, cinema for the uh, first time. I saw it. Yeah, same. And and it's interesting how. Both of these films have slightly uh, morphed uh, in in my understanding of them, I guess, um, which is a slightly clumsy way of putting it. What I mean is my reaction to them is slightly different. So I never detected any humour in either of these films the first time I watched them. Yeah. But when I watched them again um, uh, recently, there is definitely attempts at humour. There's definitely uh, attempts at the gore being something funny totally yeah yeah there's the scene way way into the film way where um uh, somebody's hand is is kind of gets stuck under the wheels of this trolley and it's it's quite funny like it's quite a funny um slapstick moment and i just hadn't really taken that stuff in and also we i'm sure we'll get onto this later but the 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 eye scene um it's it's kind of funny like it i mean i don't think i'm not saying i was sitting there chuckling i'm just saying that the presentation of it is is more comic than i thought it's so absurd it's much more absurd isn't it i suppose in that way again it's it's apples and oranges when you compare it to something like martyrs in terms of again and how this torture right. is portrayed yeah. and that's fine i mean it's interesting isn't it i mean let me ask you for, about that first of all because mm. you know i don't in theory there's nothing i don't think there's a that's a problem like i you know i i kind of you know so many countless horror films have that kind of cathartic violence where you mm. might laugh at it right i mean look at again yeah. going back to every single friday the 13th film what do you watch that for if not for watching teens die Absolutely. in kind of inventive imaginative ways right yeah and i'm sure you had this uh, when i had it when i saw hostel at the cinema people were laughing people were gasping yeah. people were wincing at those moments and i think they are supposed to make you laugh right I think so too, and I also think there's a lot more discipline in 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 the the directing and the filmmaking. You know, there's the bit where uh, I think the first um, like properly, oh, this is horrible moment is that is where the toe's about to be snipped off. Yes, and it's a really good cut. Like, it, uh, I mean, the <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not making kind of uh, <laughs> kind comments of surgical. on the surgery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Anatomical admiration. Yeah. yeah, it's really well done. Um, it's a, that the cut when you when you almost see the the toe get snipped off is really good. Like I have to say, it works yeah. brilliantly well. Um, and there's a couple of other bits like that as well. And I, uh, yeah, that scene um, with the eye uh, in the cinema, it, it, it was it was it was a perfect horror moment in many ways. Like something I'd never seen before. Couldn't believe I was seeing it. Yeah. So in that respect, I think it's it's uh, it's pretty successful. Again, I, I just wish that some of this nastier stuff, um, and I mean in terms of, you know, um, some of the language used, some of the, uh, certainly the depiction of, of, of most of the women in this film. Like, I think one of the first women uh, characters we see is is basically dumped on a table by Oli. In Oli? Oli? Mm, Oli? Yeah, Oli. It might just be Oli. I'm not really Oli, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They say Oli, don't they? Yeah. But I wonder whether, whether that's... Anyway, yeah. Um, it dumped on a table. And then they have this conversation where, um, I don't know if it's Josh or Paxton, says, we can't, rail a ge- we can't rail a girl who's in a coma. Yeah. And it's just... this. From the offset, it's just like, oh man, what this is, is a this? bit gross. I know, it's so... Again, like, I just wish that it felt a bit more like a horror film. And I, yeah, this is the problem yeah. with Cabin Fever. This is the problem I have with Eli Roth's films, is that yeah. for somebody who loves horror as much as he does, hmm. they don't feel like horror films. They feel no. like... I mean, you mentioned sex comedies, Porkies. They feel like you're watching yeah. Porkies with a bit of blood and torture thrown in. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. 
there's no attempt to build suspense really no, or atmosphere. No. It's just like the first act of this film is just like lads on tour, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, there's 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 no attempt to kind of build it up as a horror genre piece in the first yeah. act of this film. It is literally dudes being dudes on it vacation, is. isn't it? And it's nasty. Like the, I I wonder whether this see this is the thing, right? There, there is a, there is an argument to be made that we're being made to despise these, yes, yes these guys yes. up front that we're that we're meant that we're meant to kind of uh, position them as as abhorrent and horrible people that we really, really don't like. That um, when they get punished for their crimes, we're kind of glad about it, and there's a catharsis in that. Yes, you could, you can argue that. The only thing I would say in response to that is there's a lot of unnecessary stuff in there. And also, we we are part of this leering uh, camera's gaze. So there's that, you know, really quickly we see um, nudity, don't we? Sort of uh, topless women and stuff like that. Which, which again, you see, there's a way to... Sh- if you're making the point that these people are abhorrent for treating women like objects, right? If, 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 there's the, if that's the point you're making, yes. there's a way to shoot this stuff that doesn't leer that doesn't make us also part of this um this process of kind of objective objectifying women absolutely um and i think that 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 if if it is making that point which i don't necessarily think it is but if it is making that point there's another way you can do that you can kind of have your cake and eat it so to speak you can make a film that's talking about these things whilst not doing them but unfortunately for me the point at which we get this apparent flip where suddenly it's not the usual um, situation where it's uh, you know um, a, a woman who's being uh, unmade or, or or you know hacked to pieces as as is usual I guess in in slasher movies. Yeah, it's the men that are, that are being um, literally kind of dissected uh, and torn to pieces. Yes. And, and and the subject of of the gaze. But by but for me by that point it's far too late because you've just spent an hour doing the thing that you seem to be trying to criticize in that last act. Yes. So you know and you know I don't know. There's that bit where they look up at the at the window and they see uh, the woman who's a, a sex worker and and they they just make a really horrible comment. I think he says something like, um, "I hope bestiality is is legal in Amsterdam." And it's just like, why is that there? It, it's just nasty. And and in the in the sort of details of the film as well, for me, like um, there's that scene where they arrive at the hostel in Slovakia, and uh, the receptionist turns around to get them their key, and the camera pans down, yes, to her backside, basically, yes. yes. And it's it's just like, but yeah. but who who is that? Who's, that Who's for? doing that? Yeah, yeah. Who, is that is that? Are we supposed to? Is that supposed to be the the boys leering at her, or are you doing that so that we can leer at her? Because I think if it's the latter, it's it, you know it's even more uh, problematic. And then you know later where we have these these two women who who meet uh, uh, Paxton and, and Josh, uh, uh, who are Natalia and, and Svetlana, and later they are <laughs> they're literally replaced, yeah, uh, by two other similar. Yeah. What similar looking? I don't even think they are similar looking. No. But that they, they, they're replaced by two other women, and it's. I just think details like that are really interesting and, and really kind of telling to me. Yeah, anyway. I agree. Um, I think Eli Roth. I mean, Eli Roth has definitely gone on the record and said that this film is supposed to be about that sort of judgment of the American characters, though. I think mm. right. I mean, I think in theory. He was making this film as a sort of response to everything that was going on that we talked about at the beginning of this discussion, Mm -hmm. America's kind of uh, invasion of Iraq and the way that Americans have treated people in some of these other countries and used them and taken from them and the sort of the greed and the uh, the violence and mm. um, all of that, right? He's he's kind of trying to tell in that sort of Romero metaphorical way in a genre film. I think that's I think that's really interesting. I mean, the 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 use of um, the 
the fact that they are American is 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 underlined so many times in this film. It's not so yes. so it's interesting, isn't it? That it's not just about uh, the fact that they're kind of young people who are who are being killed or, and, and yes. hunted, if you like. It is really specifically about them being American. It is, and it's said so many times um, in that film. You know, even right at the start when he, when they're kicked out of the uh, out of the club. Yeah, uh, I think it's either Josh or Paxton says, you know, I'm an American. I I've got rights. Yeah. You've got that really interesting scene as well where um, Paxton uh, kind of meets his his torturer and um the the guy who shows the torturer in who sort of works at the uh, the this torture factory if you like yeah. says um you know his American speak and he yes. makes him speak to identify that he is American and the thing that stops the torturer pursuing his, uh, you know his his the torture is when Paxton starts speak, speaking to him in German. Yes, and suddenly, and then they have to gag him. They have to gag him. So, so it is. There's a really interesting comment being made about the American uh, body, and all, and there's another fascinating moment I think where. Um, the business card of the elite hunting um, where Paxton gets hold of that after he's managed to escape the first time mm. and he turns it over and there's there's a bit of a handwritten tariff on the back. And what you'll notice in that scene is that at the bottom is American and it is the most money. You yes. have to pay most, uh, That you know, you have to pay top dollar, so to speak, yes. f- to, to obtain an American. So, Americans are at once valuable, but also sought after and the know, most the, the, despised, right? Exactly. The most despised. exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that stuff in theory on paper is interesting. Mm, I don't necessarily think that Eli Roth has, has executed it as well as as well as it could have been, because which is a shame. That there's something quite frustrating about that because when watching it again, especially mm. right off the back of Cabin Fever, which was so unbelievably vacuous, watching yeah. Hostel, I was like, Do you know what? There is a lot more going on in this. I kind Definitely. of like what it's trying to do and I, I do think some of those elements of it are interesting I liked the conversation that he had with the other guy mm. who I think is also American you know when he's pretended right. that he has just tortured somebody when he's in like yeah. the, whatever it is like a sort of changing room right and um that American guy is like kind of sucking himself up and he's like, yeah, come on. Yeah, what, what was it like? What did you do? Oh, you paid for an American. Oh, rich and stuff. Like, yeah, it yeah. kind of gives you a bit of that as well, doesn't it? And um, it does. I don't know. But then also you can look at it in the other way of like how it treats quote unquote foreigners in this film yeah. and everything yeah. else too. And it's like, you know, there, there's it's 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 not... <sighs> I think, Again, it's I just think, not maybe as executed it as well as it could be. No, but I think that the the, the biggest I want to no, okay. So one of the biggest problems I have with with cabin fever is that I can't find my way into what it's reacting to, what what it is symptomatic of. Yeah. Whereas with hostile, I don't. In some ways, if you're looking at it from this point of view, I don't think it even really matters the agenda of of the filmmaker. It, it's an interesting piece of cinema because of the things that it is symptomatic of because of the anxieties it seems to be demonstrating and reacting to at that moment in history yes you're so, right. so so you know um there's that good old essay by roland bart about the death of the author and about essentially how we all bring something to a, a reading of anything and i think i do think that applies with with um with of course it applies to cinema as well so if you're, de- you know, what I'm saying is, if you're, if you're detecting really interesting stuff in there, I think it's all right to find yeah, that stuff. It's all there. It's all, it's all there. Yeah. And I don't think, you, I don't think there's any. Um, the, all the problems that the film has, and all the things that we find, you know, horrible and and abhorrent, and the rest of it, I think you can have those two things at the same time. Yes, I guess yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely, you can. And I did very much find that on this watch. You know, I was there was stuff that I was. That I was enjoying or appreciating at the same time as 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 kind of finding it abhorrent. So you yeah, know, and I think yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, what is going on with the character of Josh, and is he supposed to be gay? Is I don't there know. is there some sort of gay subtext going on there, or is that just am I thinking too much into it? There's that whole encounter on the train, right? Yeah. Where the guy who turns out to be a torturer uh, comes mm. and sits with them in the train carriage. It's kind of awkward. He's eating with his hands and they all find it disgusting. And then he grabs Josh's leg. Josh reacts in the way that every male Eli Roth character reacts to that. <laughs> um, but then later on, Josh kind of feels bad about it and Josh puts his hand on the other that guy's leg yeah. in the bar. And that man talks about how... 
oh, I know what you're going through. I chose to have a family. And essentially kind of like they're having a conversation about being closeted and gay, I think. But again, could, I was like, be. then that is just never brought up again for the it's rest of the explored, film. It's not explored, is it? It's really weird. And again, because I was like, oh, this might be kind of interesting. Is, is Eli yeah. Roth actually going to comment for once on that kind of homophobic bro yeah. culture that he yeah. portrays but he didn't <laughs> be- i know i know because and, and actually now that you've said it of course josh doesn't go into uh doesn't go through with um having sex with the sex worker no. in, in the brothel and there's an interesting line um that he says i think it's josh who says you know going into your room sorry going into a room and doing whatever you want to somebody isn't exactly a turn on or something like that. Yes, and it's yes. obviously you know mirrored later in in what the film turns out to be. Yeah, um, I hadn't really thought of that. I think that's an interesting point of view. If it's not that, um, it's you know that moment where he flinches and is and 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 screams at the guy is really kind of aggressive and unpleasant to watch, isn't it? And horrible. Homophobic. Um, and again, the film kind of then just ends up backing that up because he is, he does turn out to be the creepy torturing psychopath. Yeah. Like he, yeah. he, he is this creepy homosexual who is also a murderer. Like they're, they're, and yeah. that's it. There is no comment. Like that's it. So yeah. it's like, you know, I, and I was like, damn it, Eli, you came close there to know, maybe doing something interesting, you know? I know. Um, but I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. And it, it certainly isn't carried through as an idea. We, uh, so unless, you know, unless I've missed on my many, many <laughs> watches. <laughs> I'm sure you haven't. I'm, I've missed that. I, I certainly wasn't looking for that as a point, but it would be interesting to go back and have a look at it and see whether that there is anything the way it's carried through. But I don't think so because the, all that really happens then is that Josh gets taken and he's dissected, right? Like kind of in... Yeah. in it almost seems like the whole uh, agenda of that, of that old guy shifts. Like if that was his point if he was being predatory um in a sexual way which again i didn't really think was what was going on but that's not what happens in the torture room he just he talks about wanting to be a surgeon and yeah and has nothing to do with anything it's nothing to do with it and then yeah i don't know it's, it's <laughs> i don't know it's so strange and I, again you know like it just it it throws a lot in, doesn't it? It just it does, throws yeah. a lot in uh, where you kind of go, oh, that's why have they done that? And then it's just kind of, yeah. it's 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 lost. Um, yeah. What about, I mean, we did touch upon this briefly, but the torture itself, I mean, how yeah. do you find it? Do you, do you know, how do you think the gore looks and holds up? And, and how effective do you think these scenes of torture are? I think they're pretty effective. I mean, it's yeah. hard to watch this movie and not squirm and, and kind of jump out of your seat at certain points and, and be kind of, you know, disgusted and feel... Yeah revulsion and the rest of it the achilles tendon Oof. Um, Oof. i've written that exact phrase there <laughs> yeah it's horrible i remember the first time i saw that and it's just again it is it is pretty skillfully shot that stuff i think it is you it just is. see that for just long enough for it to be horrendous but also um uh, you know horrendous but also fleeting i think it i think it's i think it's pretty well done I, unfortunately though again i just i wrote down the the gore is really good but it's not quite enjoyable because I just feel like I'm I feel like I'm grappling with lots of different things that I'm not into Mm. and this is what I mean I think there is a version of this film where you cut out all this stuff that is kind of tasteless and and doesn't serve the the movie um and actually would be a really effective um I mean, the version Moving. of it is basically martyrs, isn't it? I mean, this this well, this, this kind it, yeah. of corridor of cells run yeah. by these people who are a, a, an actual organisation torturing yeah, yeah. people. Yeah, it's just it's so hard not to compare it to martyrs, but also look at um, look at how complete opposites they are in so many other know, ways. It's so know, interesting, right? yeah, yeah, how it's pulled the, off. There are some, again, you know, to to look at some positive aspects of it. There are some nice parallel shots. So when you when early doors when we're in the brothel uh, in my um in my uh, dissertation i pulled that frame you know literally the corridor bit uh, yes. and put it next to the shot of the uh of this the corridor where the where the torture rooms are later on and it's you know there is there are some yes. pretty good um moments where it's it, the foreshadowing and, and things like that are actually pretty well done yes um i think at, at certain points yeah agreed and actually it's just kind of on a very superficial level mm. it just looks nice i mean like the the, the the setting 
is it Bratislava that they're in? Is it Bratislava? I think so, yeah. It yeah. looks gorgeous, doesn't it? I mean, like, yeah. that moment when they arrive there on the train and you see the sort of the river and the buildings and just from that kind of, like, touristy perspective, yeah, there's yeah, something oh, yeah. a little bit nicer about this yeah. film to just kind of spend time in these, you know, <laughs> in, in these places. You it know? made me want to go on holiday, which is oh. a weird response to I know, Hostel, I suppose. I know, <laughs> right? It's just like, I want to go there. It's, it looks nice. It's so funny. Um, um, yeah. You know, it's really, <clears throat> another film that I, I I imagine you must have mentioned that we mm. haven't talked about yet, but another huge film from this era was Saw, right? Yes, and, and exactly. And how, how do you think, are you a fan of Saw? I am. I, re- I mean, the first couple, I really enjoyed them. They're I thought just they were wonderful, aren't they? Just I mean, really fun. Again, again, <laughs> that is, is how you pull off, I think, a really nasty, gory film. But yeah. the one that has story it has story yeah, yeah. it has stakes it has characters it's, it has a it has a through line it has a yeah. structure you know yeah. um and well, it, it i mean suspense story is primarily story like yeah you know yet to yes, play yeah exactly it, you get these obviously these horrible um tricky to watch moments that are you know that you do squirm in your seat but it's it, they are dotted around a story and almost like you know a, an escape room um you feel like you watch you, yeah you know, you're in, involved in an escape room and um i still think there are some really interesting things about um watching and about um you know uh, observing torture in those films and again a lot of that stuff you're behind a camera um uh, and you're kind of observing a situation or, or certainly um, in the second movie you are. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, that that is something I, I, I think that um, Eli Roth does chuck in there, certainly with this this scene, which came to be known as the eye-gasm scene, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, with, with um, where Kana gets, uh, I don't know how to put this except to say gets her eye cut off. Yes, which, yes, it's, it's like the, the 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 ocular the cord. I don't know what yeah. that's called. The cord no, that the, the eyeball is connected bit. to. The dangly bit is yeah. snipped, isn't it? It's a Snips really off. that is a and really then, gross scene. But again, if you deconstruct that scene, it's quite interesting because you have a. It's obviously a moment of. Ex, it's the most extreme moment in the film, and it's yes. the most gory moment, and it's one of the most famous moments, and it, it's on lots of lists of you know most gory moment in a film. Yeah. And then you have this, for want of a better term, Mike, you have this ejaculation, don't you? When that absolutely, happens, you get this absolutely. kind of gunk comes out of uh, comes out of of, of the wound, um, and I don't think I, I I don't think that's accidental. I think it's a. I think there is. Uh, almost like a Michael Haneke esque accusation yes. at that moment of you know where it's to do with the eye, it's to do with looking, it's to do with gazing, and it's really in the way it's presented, tied up with 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 sex. Um, yeah. And I think actually, in many ways, it's the archetypal perfect torch upon moment yes um, you know the money shot, so to speak. Yes, you're absolutely right. And again, that's fine. I mean, I think that's all mm. quite fun stuff it's interesting yeah. stuff it's fun stuff you know it may not be our favorite subgenre but i think there's an audience for that and there's a Definitely. there's a there's a place for that in the horror genre you know those kind yeah, of yeah. you know splatter movies basically splatter movies and and, mm. and and when done well that's fine and it did even watching it today it mm. made me squirm it made me wince and then it made me laugh and i'm sure that yeah. is all of the reactions that eli roth wanted me yeah. to have so in that <laughs> yeah. regard he was successful right you know that's the thing and yeah. and it, you can see what he's interested in you know you can see that again there's that feeling of he he probably thought up the gore and the the the, the set pieces first mm. and reverse engineered the rest and mm. and you can see what moments shine in these films and then what yeah. just feels like awful, arduous, painful yeah, yeah. window dressing, you know, or mm. filler. Uh, ca- the character stuff he just can't do, basically. What What are your thoughts, by the way, on on this idea of of the safety of watching torture? I'm, th- I'm kind of thinking mm. about the historical context, you know, because obviously um, I think it was a couple of years before this, um, we had the emergence of these photographs from... Abu Ghraib of 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 soldiers you yes. know, torturing detainees and things like that and and again this conversation about what torture was was, was happening at that time yes. and, and it seemed in some camps that that the acts that we would consider to be torture were trying to almost in some ways trying to be downgraded to to not yeah. torture so that they could continue yeah or all the, all the, the waterboarding stuff it was a yeah. huge debate wasn't it in America that went on and yeah. on and on yeah 
and I just wonder if I wonder what your thoughts are on 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 this idea of the safety of watching this stuff in this way, the curiosity. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I know. Well, I th- I do. You, we've all got to admit that there is that morbid curiosity. I think mm. it's it's always there, and it's the, it is the reason we decide to watch a, a, a gore film it is mm. for for seeing that. I mean, I'm really not good with torture. It's the one thing that I I and it's not actually hostile was fine. It's mm. not gory torture. It's no. um it's sadistic torture. It's um it's sallow. It's yeah. it's martyrs. It's like um the bits that I find most uh, upsetting and sallow are mm. the 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 sort of humiliation moments more than the gory mutilation moments. Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? It's the yeah, it's, totally. It's that emotional and mental torture, I suppose, yeah, that I find yeah. really difficult to watch. But of course, the point of it is that it's really difficult to watch. And watching, I guess. The way I feel about it is that watching torture should mm. be torture, right? I mean, I guess yeah. that's the thing. It should feel like torture to have to sit there and watch it. And, you know, the last 30 minutes of Martyrs is just awful. It's not fun in any way. No, it's not enjoyable. No. It's not a thing that I want to ever choose to sit down and watch, really. No. And I don't uh, think you could... I, I I wouldn't categorize it as torture porn, that film. I, it, no. It, it doesn't have that... Uh, good, oh, I don't know. That It's not... Oh, I nearly said it's not gratuitous. I it it doesn't lack metaphor. I'm going to go back to George Romero. It seems to be about something else. It doesn't just seem to be about the in inverted commas fun of watching it. Um, um, no, it's not sexy. That's what it is. The no, violence is not no, sexy. Exactly. Um, the 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 way that the uh, characters are treated, that the main character is treated and tortured in Martyrs. Mm. The, the, there's a, it's long, long, long scenes that are shot from quite far away. It's a kind of wide shot of a cell as this yeah. man walks in, beats this girl, punches her repeatedly, force feeds her. And it's all from this kind of almost surveillance camera looking shot from up mm. above. There's nothing mm. kind of like intrusive about it in a way. And that in mm. itself makes it feel even more uncomfortable, I think, to yeah. sit through. But it, it it's not edited or shot or lit to look cool or exciting or sexy, you know? No. Um, no. It's really interesting. It's I mean, it's such a difficult, fine line. And I, I don't think that yeah. Martyrs is perfect in that regard either. I know, no. I know a lot of people do. I'm still a little bit dubious as to, mm, does this director, Pascal Logier, actually just quite enjoy throwing in a bit of violence towards women yeah. to shock as well, you know? Um, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Like, But... Yeah, I don't know. It's really hard to land w- on one way or the other about it. I think you know? it is. And I, 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 I come back to funny games on this as well, this kind of slightly chiding uh, approach uh, of that. And what, what I find quite interesting is is that um, it wasn't long after this that the remake of Funny Games came along. Yes. The yes. American remake. And I wonder, I could be wrong, but I wonder if... Hanukkah was was almost trying to bookend it in some way. I don't know. I mean, I'm mm. completely speculating. Of course, I am. I, I have no idea. But this, I, it does seem like it comes along at this moment, perfect moment where you get this film that's kind of saying you should not be watching this. Yeah. Well, I watched the original Funny Games when I was probably not long after it had come out, so I was really young. I was far too young to have watched it. But then I watched. Um, Another another quick story about my partner. Yeah, I think Funny Games was the first film we saw together at the cinema. <laughs> oh my god! To see Funny Ga- the remake, you know. Holy shit! Um, I know what an idiot. What was I thinking? <laughs> and she's not she's not into horror at all. She, I mean, honestly, wow. Um, so but, funny. But I d- even you know um, she's not into it at all. But she, I think, recognised. Well, I know that she recognised. She, we talked about it before. How interesting that that point is. I do have a bit of a soft spot for it, and I do think it's an interesting question. At that time, it came out in two thousand and seven. Um, so, so the year after Hostel, Hostel yeah. two thousand and six. So, I think that I think it is interesting. It is so interesting, and it's. I'm sure it's it's all connected, and and it's something that the horror genre has made us wrestle with forever. You know, yeah. pe- peeping Tom, anything. You know, there yeah, is so much yeah. of that. Look at a lot of you know Blue Velvet. There are a lot of movies about that, right? About the mm. about voyeurism and mm-hmm. kind of that make us reckon with ourselves for why mm-hmm. we like watching this, and it is a really hostile is just an interesting film for so many reasons uh, you yeah, know yeah. compared to all of these other things we've been talking about martyrs and funny games and all these mm. other f- films that are much more on the kind of art house spectrum or or, mm. or very grindhouse spectrum um you know 
Hostel was a studio film. Tarantino's yeah. name was on the poster. Yeah, yeah. It made a load of money. It opened wide theatrically. It made $19 million in its first weekend, and it was number one in the box office. Mm-hmm. So for mm-hmm. whatever reason, audiences were ready to watch mm-hmm. a film about American teens getting tortured. And that yeah. in itself, no matter how good or bad the film is, it's like, it's interesting, isn't it, that this yeah. film did create this kind of impact, you know? On totally. The culture. I- and I went, I went, well, if, you know, I don't want to come across as Mr. High and Mighty. I went to see that movie yeah, me on, too. on the strength of what it promised. You know, yeah. I wasn't going as some sort of haughty <laughs> academic <laughs> exactly, or anything exactly. ready to. I wasn't. I was going because I wanted to watch a horror movie, you know, that, that had got a load of hype. So, yeah, yeah I think it, I think and, it was. And so it is. It's, it's, it will forever be an interesting thing. And I think it's something that has slightly gone away right now. We, mm. we, we, we as, as, and I'm talking mainstream, you know, because there are always, yeah, yeah. there are always niche horror films everywhere. But there, when you look at the big big grossing horror films it's it's james wan right it's or yeah. it's it's hereditary or it's the conjuring it's it's mm. we're not in a place right now for whatever reason where we want to see buckets of blood and gore and torture in our mainstream yeah. horror films yeah. and it's just really interesting to see how and why that climate shifts all the time isn't it i mm. think mm-hmm. you know i and, think so you know who knows who knows i just i think we all just got, perhaps i definitely got sick of it you know, just got oh, yeah. as, a, as a genre, and, and uh, you know, I was ready. I was ready for uh, for something else. And I think that was the other thing that there were there, were, there was a film like, you know, Hostel and Saw, uh, and a couple of others that that di- were doing something. They were treading their own path. Whatever you think of them as movies, they were treading their own path. They were doing something new and interesting. Yeah. And then there was just millions of it's. It felt like carbon copies that were just again just that. Preoccup- if you imagine Hostel being entirely preoccupied with the body and the and the unmaking of the body, you know, and then you just get a load of films that that don't even have the story that Hostel has. No, no, um, no, just you know, like people being tortured in a basement, and that's literally it. tedious. Yeah, <laughs> and then I think I I do think it kind of hit its peak. It kind of became an absolute joke, and this happens with with waves, you know, where you get to yeah. the kind of Freddy's Dead Part Eight in three D or whatever, yeah. from Leprechaun in Space. I think that this <laughs> movement hit this point with the Human Centipede. I think that was the point where we people were like, okay, we've now got to a point where people are being sewn together and they yeah. have to shit in each other's mouths, yeah, in order to and like I, it felt like, and then it was like we were done with it. It was like the yeah. nail in the coffin of 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 at least mainstream sort of torture movies you know it's really interesting can i ask you a question about a film that i've had conversations with people about that seems to kind of tip into this but for me for some reason he's outside of it and that is the loved ones have you seen oh yes well i love the loved ones yeah i love it well but it is it, it does Flirt. In fact, I showed it to a bunch of people. Uh, I I used to have these little horror nights at my house before, way before lockdown, where I, you know, I'm such a big horror fan. My other half doesn't like horror, so I have to watch them in bulk, you know. Mm. Um, and I'd get people around the house, and it was one of the movies that I put on, and a couple of the people there. Uh, including uh, my mate Ben, who was in the Book of Darkness and Light um, uh, originally, um, he di- really didn't like it. He didn't take to it at all. And and months afterwards, we were still talking about it. And he was like, oh, you know, it's just, it's kind of just. I think he said it's kind of just torture porn. And I was like, I, I think that is a film where you don't see as much as you think you do. Yeah. And for me, that is the crucial difference, right? That's why you couldn't retro, uh, you couldn't retrofit torture porn onto Texas Chainsaw. Because it's not as bloody or preoccupied with wounds, the frailty of the body, you know, the uh, the mortality of the body, as as you think it is. No, no, the deaths are the deaths are pretty quick and immediate in something like Texas Chainsaw, yeah, as well. And the loved ones, I I I seem to think there's some clever camera work where it cuts away. It's, it's, it seems to remember. The, the, yeah, the the thing with the loved ones is that it's good filmmaking. It is. Yeah. It it can feel. It is disturbing in places, and it can feel torturous. But that's. Yeah. But it's like you say, it's not showing as much as. And that's no. interesting. I mean, what, an, another one like that. I don't know if you've seen. Um, what's that film called? That amazing film, Hard Candy, 
with yes. Ellen Page and Patrick yes. Wilson, right? This, I think, is Excellent. a brilliant film. And also I've heard uh, in the conversation about torture porn, uh, yeah. there is a, a really, really disturbing, elongated kind of mutilation scene in that. I don't know if you remember, but it's not oh, yeah. really shown. Exactly, it's not happening. But my God, is it one of the most difficult things to watch and sit mm. through. But again, what a great film. It feels like everything that's happening in that film is is happening for a reason. It has a point. It has yeah. two characters that you can kind of empathize with both and can mm. be terrified by both of them. Mm. Yeah, it's like this brilliant little claustrophobic cat and mouse film. And it's I think I, it's yeah. wonderful as well. Outstanding. Um, Outstanding. Ellen Page is just oh, astonishing in that film. She's just so good. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and you don't quite know who you should be feeling for until the very yeah. very very end of that film and it's just it's yeah. very it's, it's brilliantly handled i think i wonder i wonder actually that movie captivity that i mentioned earlier i wonder actually if there's there's i don't know what oh, i don't know when they came out in re, um in regard to one another i'm not sure but i think there's something going on in that as well i think there is a there is an interesting thing in going right back to the earliest gothic literature yes about about the grotesque um, being just as grotesque, even when it's not real, yes. even when it's it's artifice and theatre, and I think that's an interesting thing that that perhaps is missing from a lot of torture porn. Mm-hmm. Um, this idea of, of the theatre um, uh, of violence and and actually, yeah, I don't know. Rather yeah. than just showing as it, it ab- absolutely, it's not operatic in any way. Well, I think that's it ultimately, isn't it? I I, I think especially i guess me and you we we like films that kind of are going to use the filmmaking to draw us in emotionally into yeah. something you know we we love lake mungo which is literally a film where you basically see nothing right you see photographs of empty rooms and stuff and yet yeah. it's one of the most terrifying chilling and moving films ever made and i think that you know no matter how much you throw into hostel how much gore there is mm. if if the filmmaking isn't up to scratch and if the writing isn't up to scratch, yeah. you're basically just watching a bunch of gory set pieces and, and laughing at them. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know. And that's that's the that's the difference, isn't it, ultimately, mm. with, with the different types of torture. I think that's right. And I think if if it if the movie sets its stall out so early with its attitudes towards, you know, women and mm. and as I say, we've got this homo- homophobic uh, language going on in there which which is needless and doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be doing anything you know obviously your point about Josh is really interesting but to me it didn't seem to be to be doing anything um when it does that when it sets its stall out like that i think it's really easy to just go uh okay well what what else is there then what i'm watching and and i take i do take badly i'm afraid <laughs> when yeah. that kind of thing happens and I, and I, then i'm not necessarily on the side of of the film uh, the film mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah agreed agreed so there you go. I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? And I wonder whether... Um, w- do you think this kind of wave of movies... Do you, do you see something like this returning? Do you think that we're likely to get another kind of trend of movies like Hostel and, you know, Captivity and Saw and, 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 and that kind of thing? Or is that sort of dead in the water now, that format? I, I don't know, because I, like I say, you know, I haven't gone too much into it um today because i didn't want to just sit and read my dissertation out mike because <laughs> that would not have been interesting maybe we'll make that uh, patreon content people can pay for yeah. it <laughs> um but it, 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 it for me it was bound up with politics and 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 things that were happening in society you know mm. at that moment and and you know there's all sorts of incredible uh, books written on this topic of of you know um post 9-11 really I guess you know you've got Precarious Life by Judith Butler and that's uh, uh, one example that I used quite a bit and um, and I think for me it, it, it was bound up with politics and I wonder whether we'll have I hope we don't have another moment like that where these where these revelations uh, come out about torture and, and the way people have been treated um, but I just don't know maybe Maybe kind of you know the, a new wave of torture porn would be reacting to something completely different. Um, yeah, it, they always seem to come back, don't they? But I think now that they're now that torture porn is kind of in the swim of horror, so to speak, it's sort of part of you know you'll go to fright fest and you'll see a a movie that would fit you know neatly into the the torture yeah. porn category, wouldn't yeah. you? Whether you'll get another wave, I don't know. Um, 
but probably. <laughs> yeah. In summary, probably. It could, it could happen, couldn't it? I, I think yeah. there's something interesting as well about, you know, these different... And there's always been there's always been political turmoil there's always been social turmoil and and, yeah. and I'm thinking mainly of america here but the the that fear that 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 terror that fear of literally the the fear of terror and um yeah, yeah. that war on terror that was happening at that point there was such a fear of the outsider i suppose a kind of outside force whereas you feel like with with the last few years with trump's america it's going to be very much about the horrors from within america right i mean it's a very different it's an internal horror i suppose ultimately those other ones are too because some of the more smart ones are talking about how america treated this war and everything but but i think it's more overtly now about horrors from you know the 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 social structure the actual american dream Mm. is is kind of really being commented on i think in in horror right now which is interesting yeah i think perhaps you're right i mean but i mean there there is like you say there is a little of that in in hostel in fact there's a there's a, a moment where that character alex says something and um, it's when they when they go up to his room. I don't know quite. They go up that ladder, don't they? And they, they go up to his room, and he says something that really put me in mind of that awful um, recorded footage of of Donald Trump on that on that bus where he's talking about grabbing women. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can find it. Um, he's, oh yeah, Alex says um, you just take them in in regard, you know, in in yes. reference to women, you just take them, and I just thought actually. It was alarming to me how reminiscent of 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 uh, that particular um, audio of of Trump that was. It really was like, wow, that's that's very interesting to me. Um, yeah, um, I don't think like I don't think in Hostel that's that was trying to be representative of anything other than you know um, uh, young men kind of ogling at, at women and well and that's it again isn't women. it are, they, are these just our characters having character bants that we're yeah, supposed to yeah, like yeah, and that's that that's yeah. the question i mean eli roth you know time and time again references the film cannibal holocaust in his films i mean he, in his mm. film green inferno which is also absolute garbage by the way don't ever that. watch it but <laughs> it, it, it is basically a remake of, of cannibal holocaust and cannibal holocaust was this really interesting nasty horrible film and it's, it's yeah. really gross in a lot of ways but also it was kind of a, again making a point about these american documentary makers coming over to to to, to make a film in the rainforest uh, in the mm. amazon and the way that they treat these people who live there, these mm-hmm. indigenous people, and then are tortured and killed for it. And it's very on the nose. The last line of Cannibal Holocaust is literally this this guy steps outside and he's just, you know, he's just gone through all this stuff and he goes, but who are the real monsters? And uh, <laughs> that's my question for Eli Roth. Who are the real <laughs> monsters in your film, Eli? Like, who yeah. who are we supposed to be hating? Who are we supposed to be yeah. disgusted by? You know, because I don't know if he makes that clear enough. No, I totally agree. I haven't, I've never seen Cannibal Holocaust either. Like, so I just want to make it clear that I'm not somebody who like gravitates to this stuff. Yeah, I, but you've yeah, but you've watched Sallow like ten times, Adam. I, I mean, have, that's that's oh, that's the it's ultimate. indelible as well. Let me tell you, it's indelible. It's in there. Does it put you off chocolate cake for life? Because uh, it definitely did for me. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Let's wrap it up there, um, Adam. Thank you so much for this. What a fun, what a fun discussion. You know, it was, it was. nice to. It was nice to talk about something a bit different together um so tell us where can people find you and more of your work out there online oh yeah come and join me on on twitter um and that's at adam underscore z e d so it's at adam z but with uh at adam underscore z but with z e d mm-hmm. um and facebook search for the book of darkness and light that's my um facebook page you can also find me adam z robinson on on facebook as well so yeah just come and say hi Amazing. Adam, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks a lot. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my brilliant guest, Adam Robinson. So, what did you think of this week's episode? What do you think of these two movies? Were me and Adam being a bit hard on these two films? Do you want to stick up for them? Do you think there's more to these movies than meets the eye? I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Please do get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this week's episode and the 
movies and anything else horror related with fellow listeners then join the discussion group that's the evolution of horror discussion group and that can be found on facebook if you're not a facebook user you can also join the evolution of horror subreddit that's reddit.com slash evolution of horror if you want to support this podcast then sign up to our patreon patreon.com slash evolution of horror and you can find all previous episodes and seasons of this podcast on our website evolutionofhorror.com you can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Libsyn, Stitcher, Acast, and Podbean. If you get a spare minute, please do drop us a little rating or review on Apple Podcasts, which we would be hugely grateful for. It helps us get discovered by new listeners. So that's it for now. Next week, we've got more gruesome body horror to discuss. Next week, I'm going to be joined by longtime friend of the pod, Louise Blaine. And Louise and I are going to be discussing two gruesome, arguably feminist classics, Teeth from 2007 and Raw from 2016. What a double bill. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.